Hello, everyone. I am with Christina. <laughs> we are in New York. Christina is talking on a panel, and she is chopping it up. Chopping it up. Yes. Um, we're talking about gender equalities in shea butter producing communities in West Africa. So I'm here with the Global Shea Alliance. They invited me to speak on the panel, and I've had a ball. It's been exciting. We're meeting a lot of new people, and I'm glad that you were able to join me. <laughs> yes, I'm filming, by the way. And of course, I'm here to support Christina and 54 Thrones, and I'm just so excited. She did such a good job. Thank you. <laughs> you killed it. <laughs> Christina, she is a serial entrepreneur and founder of founder and CEO of 54 Thrones, an African social impact beauty brand. 54 Thrones develops beauty products like black soap, shea butter, shea butter creams, oils, and other personal care products to help create living wages for women in Ghana, Morocco, Egypt, and Uganda. We have Wumi, whom we all know and love dearly. She is the Deputy Managing Director in charge of international partnerships at the Global Shea Alliance. She also oversees the implementation of the GSA sustainability programs and manages GSA's external communications. And finally, we have Cynthia Mo. Cynthia is the CEO of Africans Gone Natural. She graduated from Albany University with a BS in accounting and minor in economics summa cum laude, by the way. She continued her studies and graduated from Montclair State University with a master's degree in finance and international business. Let's welcome all our panelists. So our discussion this morning is about gender equality in producing communities. And this is an area that is near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things we all know, whether um, shea is being used or in food or it's used in cosmetics, but especially in cosmetics, every time I go into Walmart or I go into Target and I see any product that has a shea nut on it, I don't even care if they're using like a fraction of a percentage in it. I always like to tell whoever is with me that, do you know for that shea butter to get into that jar of cream or that pump lotion bottle of of cream for your body, an African woman somewhere bent her back to pick up the shea nuts. And so African women are the foundation of this industry. And that's why this whole issue of gender equality in producing communities is necessary to the sustainability of the industry. Because without those women, there will be no shea. All right. So I'm going to ask our panelists a quick question just to kick things off. And I'm going to start with um, Wumi to my left. And um, Wumi, what is your relationship with shared communities through your work or family? I would probably say more through your work. Right. So um, I have had the opportunity to um, visit a lot of the communities where she is being produced. Um, I was fortunate enough to get recruited to come work at the Alliance um, under our sustainability program. And when I started my career at the Global Shea Alliance, I really just thought that that was what it was. But going into those communities uh, about in seven different countries, I'm able to see how this is beyond um, something that gives this women a livelihood, but something that also kind of like increases their status in, the, in, in their communities. Um, it, it's different for, life is much more different when a woman is able to um, have income of her own, something outside her husband. Uh, and she's able to also control the way she uses that income. Um, and that, you could see, raises her uh, standing in the community that she, she, she's from. She's more respected, she's more heard. Um, some people, well, in Northern Ghana would say, well, traditionally women are supposed to be seen, not heard. But she is something that's starting to give women voices. Um, the story of the impact of shame with women and gender equality plays out. So um, I would like to start off by um, sharing a little history about my company, African Go Natural. It started off as a social um, social media movement and power movement to embrace their natural self. And that's the name Africans Go Natural. Basically what we do is to post pictures of women um, with their natural hair and also educating women on 
why it's dangerous to use products that have chemicals in it, and why you should also be empowered to um, to represent who you are, right? So during the course of this campaign, we realized um, our passion for um, women. So when it grew, everybody can see how social media have trained with a lot of women becoming entrepreneurs from it. So whilst we were brainstorming on how we can move this um, movement to the next level, we realized we have the passion for empowering women. So why not work with Women Corp in Ghana to help them market their, um, their product? So we work with the Women Corp in the um, northern region of Ghana to help market their shade. We also have um, shea butter and other products too. With this um, involvement with these women, we can see that now that the women have income, they feel more respected. Um, one, the director of the co-op told me that at one point when the women were getting their pay, one lady said, oh my God, now I'm, I'm going to be the lord of the house. <laughs> right? So she was like jumping around because now that she has money, um, now the men have to depend on them to at times loan them some money. So like you said, the voices are being heard. So for me, I feel like we, our involvement with the women is helping bridge the gap of gender inequality. That's wonderful. What we're hearing is that women are finding their voices as they become more economically empowered. And so I want to pose that same question to you, um, Cynthia. In your line of work as a brand owner who works um, to empower women, not just in West Africa, um, but I'm sorry, I'm like, Christina, I'm sorry. Um, you're empowering women in Uganda, Morocco, and also in West Africa, where she butter comes from. What have you found that some of the impacts of the work you're doing is on the lives of the women you work with in all these various countries? Um, I think it's similar to what Cynthia just said. I think when women are given a way to make income and make more income, then obviously their voices are heard a lot more in their communities and their home life because a lot of times women who are making more money, they make a lot of the decisions in the home already, but now when they actually have you know, money to back it up, it, it, it helps them more in their family life and their communities and it just keeps trickling down, which is why um, with my beauty brand, 54 Thrones, we like to actually go directly to every cooperative, every person that makes our products, we go there. I go to Morocco, I go to Egypt. We just got back from Uganda and South Africa because we really want to show the part beyond just the product you order online. We want to show the women and some men who are actually making these products, who are small business owners, who are leaders in cooperatives, and show like the full circle of where our products come from. Um, so in just doing that, we've educated more people. It's like how you said when you go to the drugstore and you see something made with shea butter, you tell the story. That's the same thing that we do with our brand. And just kind of going on that, um, how do you think people respond to the stories that you're telling when you talk about um, how what you're doing is empowering women. How do you think your market and your customers are responding to that? Do you think that's an important thing for our customers to know? I think it's extremely important. I think in the, the age that we're in now, people care more about where the products they're buying come from. Um, people want to feel like they are making an impact, even if it's a small impact. So I think a lot of our customers are a bit more savvy and they like knowing that the products they buy actually serve a purpose and they're not just buying and, you know, and um, they're not just buying from a brand who doesn't care. We show that we care through all of our initiatives and how we work so closely with our artisan partners, our women cooperative partners. So I definitely think that 2019, consumers are a lot more educated and they're a lot more savvy with the products that they're buying and where they're actually putting their money. And then I'm going to talk with uh, Rita. Rita, it looks like you are on the grassroots, you are on the ground. You see, you interact with women every day, you work with them. How would you say this whole issue of gender equality um, impacts the work you do on the co-op level? I will start by saying, in our community, in our tradition, it is mostly men dominated. And in the community in which I work now, men have started giving respect to women. 
because the total dependence is shifted. You can now find men, given respect to women, and also helping them to know what they are doing in the share business. Now, a woman can own the land and also build the house as well. Women have also started showing concern and giving moral support in their children's education and also helping their husbands in the house as well. So now our voices have been heard. They now see the importance of a woman. And if a woman is empowered, what she can do or what she is able to do. So it all contributes to that. Thank you so much, Rita, because that kind of segues into the next question I was going to ask, and I'm going to take, let our other panelists address this uh, briefly, is the long-term impacts of women, women being empowered, the impact it has on the family, the communities, and do you think that impacting women's lives economically, how do you think it can actually shape Africa and our whole issue with poverty? I will start with women and then we'll walk <laughs> um, I think when you realize that women make up 52% of the population, um, and in some countries a little more, it's important to make sure that they're very well carried along and they also have, um, they're contributing to the, the society as well. Um, you have an instance where the woman really is in charge of the household, the education of her children, the health care of her children, um, uh, the upbringing of her children really depends on her. So why not just empower that woman to be able to do what she does? Um, otherwise then you have um, a situation down the line where women, kids are not educated, they're not living in good health, and just because the woman is not empowered. Um, and for me, what I've seen is empowerment is not just about increasing the income, it's really the exposure to education, which is, which is very critical. One of the things that we've seen through um, our, our cooperative training is how excited these women are to learn how to do things differently. Um, things that you come into the community and as somebody that has been exposed and ed educated is a no-brainer to you. And then you train them on that and you see their eyes light up because they now have a different knowledge of how to do things. And these women are so smart that you teach them something in their shade business, they could t definitely use that in something else that you're doing. So there's a ripple effect into what you what we're doing here. So for me, it's the fact that it is a good thing um, not to scare a lot of men. It, it is a good thing. Um, women should be equal partners, in my opinion, um, and they should be able to contribute um, to the, the, the upkeep of their family. Um, but I, I also do believe that we need to be very strategic in how we do these interventions, um, whereby the, the men who are traditionally leaders of these communities don't feel threatened. Um, so they need to be carried along, they need, their opinions need to be sought, and it should be shown as a partnership. And I think that that's critical. Um, otherwise, you have a situation where you go into a community, you're training the women, the women get empowered, the next thing you go back and the chief is like, no, the women are not available. And, and we don't want that. <laughs> to the community that I'm working. I will see that young women come to the processing center to help their mothers. Whilst I see that they should be in school by then. So I questioned the women and they said, their fathers don't have money, so they are dropped out. But when we started with the processing and the are uh, empowered now economically. They have sent back the children to school. Some girls are going to finish with their senior high education level. There was a new, a nice building in my community, a school building, but children were not attended. But since this processing center started working and women started getting money, they were able to send back the children to school. And now the school building is full. And luckily for me, and I'm so proud to say that, some organization came and trained my, part of my women to be teaching um, culture uh, Dambani in school because some of the, uh, the children they don't know uh, our culture. So part of my women also go to the school and take them Dambani mm -hmm. and the culture in the school. So I'm so proud. And that has made the men to become so proud. Um, the chief of my community also was so impressed and called to tell me that he is happy having been there because things have changed around and all the men are happy. 
Mahata. So we do things and we do it carefully, not to hurt the men, so that they can always be supported as the women as we work. I will also would like to add that I think we see the um, you know rural areas in Africa. Most Sorry, about that. <laughs> most of the men have multiple wives, right? So if money is in the hand of men, they choose who I will give to, right? Maybe if I like this wife better than the other, I will choose to give it to wife A or B. But if money is in the hands of a woman, she chooses how to allocate it. So that's why we will see that these women are investing in their children education. So that's what I would like to add to. <laughs> Um, just listening to everyone speak, it reminds me of this quote, if wealth was the inevitable result of hard work and enterprise, every woman in Africa would be millionaires. That's true. <laughs> and um, that, just, that quote always resonates with me in every African country that I go to because it's not the lack of, of um, hard work or enterprise or the want, it's sometimes it's the lack of education, um, it's the lack of opportunity. And so that's why I think GSA plays such a huge role in that because um, as Wumi said, you know, you guys come in and you show them and you educate them on the smallest things that make the biggest differences for them. Um, and so I think that whenever we look at any country, any community, when women are given, you know, um, more responsibility, more opportunity, that the community is going to thrive. Um, and that's in West Africa, that's in Asia, that's all over the world. And so um, to answer your question, absolutely, I think the disruption of women having um, you know, more of a say and more of a role and a status in the shape producing communities is, is absolutely a good thing. Thank you, ladies. Those were really great uh, responses and I found them, they resonate very strongly um, in terms of, you know, when we're looking at world poverty, especially in the developing world, statistics show that if you can invest in the women, if women can be empowered, just like you were saying, that we can actually reverse poverty by investing in women, especially in developing um, um, countries. And I remember um, at one trip I took to northern Nigeria in the Kodo area, we had done some business there. Then we went back and actually spoke to some of the community leaders, the men. And they were excited that the women were making money because when there's poverty in the family, everybody feels the pressure. So when women are more economically empowered, when they have access to resources and funds, the whole family actually does well. So that, those, those are quick responses. Um, one of the questions I wanted to bring up is knowing how much um, share and economic access that comes through the training, uh, the processing of the nuts, selling of the butter means to women and the potential impact it can have on the communities. What are some of the challenges you feel um, women are facing at this point to tr truly get that breakthrough, um, in maybe in terms of access. And what are some ideas or solutions that you have to kind of create more opportunities in that space? Well, I think the, the shea industry is growing significantly. Um, we've talked about 600% um, increase in export over the last 20 years, uh, which are very impressive figures. Uh, we're looking at um, projected growth. Um, shea is being positioned globally as, as a premium ingredient um, in cosmetics, in food. Um, it, it, it's, it's a highly sought after ingredient, it, which is good. It's good for everybody in this room and it's good for the oh, 16 million women in Africa that actually touch this product. Um, so the question is why not? Um, why, why is women's empowerment an issue, a critical issue? Um, for me and from the work that we do at the Globe Alliance, it's ensuring that they have that access to market. Um, the way the industry is stacked right now, you have to go through multiple middlemen before the woman gets back, get to the commercial off-taker. And in the process, they use uh, whatever profit margin that they could gain. So it becomes a, a game of numbers. Who could get the, the kernels at a much cheaper price? And that puts the women at a disadvantage. Um, so in, in what we're doing at this point, and I think is working greatly, is really putting the women into a cooperative, um, where we put them into a collective group where they could actually come together and rather than see themselves as independent shea collectors, they see themselves as a business. That for one changes the mentality in which they approach their work, um, and they have responsibility to the other women in, in to the other women in their co-op. 
And in doing so, you, you could see um, the way that they would go about their business differently. Um, they are more likely to interact with a commercial off-taker um, relatively in more of a professional way, um, where they could negotiate a contract, um, deliver the quality that has been agreed upon, and then they could uh, deliver on that contract. And that way they get increased in income. And they also understand that it's also a volume game. So the more kernels that they collect, they are able to make more income. So ultimately what we what we need to do is to find more ways to be able to help them achieve that goal. These women want to collect kernels, they want to make a living for themselves, and they understand the importance of the, the, the shape to their own livelihoods and in their communities. Um, so to go back to your question, we need to um, really strengthen your cooperatives, um, give them the trainings, possibly refresh the trainings um, to be able to do what you're doing. In addition to that, um, help them understand how to be more effective in the work that you're doing. So is there a way for them to better collect your kernels? Um, can they use different tools that would help them do more mechanized processing um, that would help them achieve what they're currently achieving? And also give them that linkage to the market, like how do we bring them closer to the commercial aftercare? And I think that that's what we as an industry, what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you, Mami. Uh, Cynthia, if I can phrase the question again, um, we are asking, you know, what steps um, can the industry take to um, give women better access? I know you're not necessarily a buyer, producer, but in your estimation as a woman, as an entrepreneur, someone who runs a social um, media enterprise, what are some ideas you have about things that can be done a little bit better to empower women economically? Um, I can think of multiple things, but I would like to start off with um, having a program where women can have access to um, land ownership. In these communities, um, land represents wealth and it also represents power. Right? So if there's women don't have access to land, it limits their um, involvement in producing share in a um, larger scale. So finding a way that women can also um, own this land will also really help. We should also um, think about how we can not only empower these women, um, like oh, we should also think about financial literacy uh, for women um, through maybe microfinancing. Since these women are already in the co-op, it will be easy to um, introduce the microfinancing idea and how they can uh, collectively uh, fund themselves. Um, and also, I was also um, thinking that we should not only focus on how these women are producing this shade, but how do we bring them in the value chain, right? Where they can not only just produce the shea butter, but also be part of some finished product in the shea. The center that I work with now have introduced these women to start with shea soap. Right? This will we will need like training programs that will help because making soap they can learn it. if they are making learning how to make shea butter they can learn how to make shea soap. So also help these women be part of the various stages but not just on the um, unrefined product. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Uh, Christina, I want to ask you, as a social entrepreneur, a woman business owner, um, do you see any parallels as an entrepreneur and a woman and the things that you need to keep your business growing and what the women who are shea producers um, in the communities and what they need and how this helps advance uh, what we're talking about in terms of gender equality. Do you see any parallels between your life and their lives? Um, well, I think if we break it down to the most basic of level, I need customers to stay in business and they need customers too. Um, but I think if we want to dive a little bit deeper, um, when Mumi said, I, I, re I remember that, and I, I like how they came together and solved the problem as far as forming collectives so they can get better prices together for bigger quantities for their shea nuts. And I think also with the creation of some of the warehouses, they're able to store their shea nuts as well so that 
Um, they don't just spoil and all their hard work goes to waste. So I think some of the things that they've already started implementing have made a really big difference. But I think that, like Cynthia said, they could get more on the finished product side. Because when you go to Ghana, if you go to Tamale, like where I've been and I've visited some of the cooperatives, they make a great unrefined product that gets exported to America and Europe to be sold for a hundred times more. So I think that if women and you know Ghana and, and all over had more of a foot in the actual processing of their raw um, their, to, of their raw shea butter into the finished product, to where the value is is transpired into that, they would have um, they could get more for what they're doing for what they're making because of the prices that I sell my my finished products for, they can do the same thing. That's why I think if everyone in this room, if we could play a bigger role on making um, processing facilities on ground in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Mali, in all over. I think I think that's one of the biggest things and one of the things that can make the biggest change if that's something that we also start to look into and focus on. We can have a finished product. We, the women in the processing, uh, share butter processing, I think we have all started doing that. We have seen that selling out the raw share we don't end more like using it for other products. And also, the share has a season. When the season is over, the women don't have anything. And if we say we are empowering them, it means when the season is over, they have nothing to do. And so we have also started showing them how to do the share soap, using the share for black soap, which so many people have now started using, especially the black soap and the share butter. So we have also started with the cooperative, teaching them when the season is over. But I have a little challenge to bring up so that GSA will help us solve it. I saw the discussion on our platform. Um, the fruit is supposed to rise and fall, but some of um, the big industries have uh, been pre-financing the women to harvest the share and sell to them. So in that case, we do you doing the unrefined or handcrafted share butter. Usually we don't get some of the nuts. We had a lot of challenges last year when the nuts wasn't available in the system. We have others but no cannots to produce because we don't have that money to also pay for nuts, which is not even good to harvest nuts. It's supposed to be well ripe for and then we pay. So I am putting this before GSA to see to it so that when uh, uh, so that when they stop prefinancing the women, if you do that, the poorer will become. If we say we are empowering them, you give them the money. Sometimes those women take their money and will not be able to even deliver the nuts. And there is always a problem within uh, the pickers and then the client who wants to buy the nuts. So this is up to GSA. Can I address that? Um, I, I think. There, there's a big role that pre-financing plays in, in communities. Um, I, it, so when you think about Shea, you, we need to fully understand that 90% of Shea goes into food and about 10 goes into cosmetics. So when we talk about the, the Shea butter, um, the handcrafted one, we're talking about 10% of, of the market. And we need to understand what the other part of the market needs. Um, the reason why I feel and I advocate for pre-financing is because it really helps the women um, during the lean season. So ideally, when they collect their canals, there's a pressure on them to sell it um, because they need money. But with the pre-finance, either if it's coming from a buyer or if it's coming from a microfinance or if it's coming from a credit facility, they're able to have that money to meet their pressing needs while they still store their kernels. And when the kernels are fully dry, is of high quality, they're able to sell that off for a better price. So we need to understand that pre-finance actually also has its own role and that there's an important um, part that it plays. Um, with the with the handcrafted and the the shay, I, I think the more, the question here is how do we get the women to collect more? Um, Fifty percent of shay statistically goes uncollected. So the question is how do we expand the region in which we're collecting? How do we move to places in Nigeria that has not been been um, people are not collecting from? How do we move to how how do we go to Cote d'Ivoire? Like where are the other areas? I feel like industry, we've gotten comfortable with certain countries where we where we source from, 
um, while we've now completely tapped into other countries where there's the, the raw material is available. So the, the question and the dialogue should be more around how do we do that? How do we get women to expand um, into where they collect and collect more kernels? But preferentially for me actually plays a role, in my opinion. Thank you. I think we're going to open in the panel for taking questions. Uh, we would love to hear from all our attendees. If you have any questions for the panelists, uh, please just raise up your hand and um, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer our questions. Any questions? Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for your discussion. My name is Chinani Kume of the Lyric Apothecary. And my question to you all is, what is the best way to even source a koa? Thank you. Once again, my name is Chinani Kume of the Lyric Apothecary. And my question is, what is the best way to source a koa or to even form one? Because we, like with my company, that's our next goal to get into the koa um, to start working with co-ops to empower these women, but it's hard to see where to even go to see where they are and how to form them. I can give you a lot of I think to form a co-op now in Ghana, especially in the common region, first of all, if you are a member of GSA, that one comes through um, global Sharia and coming down to the grassroots, I think you need to get people who are really into it you have to register a company before you can form a cooperative. Because we have seen so many people who come to say they are working with cooperatives, but they don't help them in any way. All they need is to get their products and go away. But if you are registered and a member of GSA, since they are coordinated with those in the industry, then everything will be okay. So that is the process we have to follow to be able to have a cooperative. Um, you could we could definitely talk um, probably like during over coffee, um, but yes, there is. Um, you just need to understand like where you want to source, what community you want to source from, how that fits into your supply chain, and then you would really have to go into the community, meet with the women, and it, it's a level of sensitization that you need to do, um, and then really have a dialogue with them. And at the end of the day, you should be able to put a group of women together and form them into a policy. Let me chat more about that. Right, thank you. Just, um, just a bit about that. Um, connecting our members, with our members among themselves, is part of the member services we deliver to all our members. So if you want to start a co-op, you want to source from a co-op, you want to uh, get in touch with a co-op, you want to do anything in the industry, you write to our Global Alliance, say, this is what I want to do. And then we'll, be, we'll do that for you free of charge as part of our membership services. Any other questions? Comments? Observations? I want to thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about um, forming confidence, especially for someone coming from outside forming a cooperative of people that we would like to source from to be very careful about social cohesion among the group because at the African Development Foundation we work with a lot of co-ops. We don't form them. We only we don't fund startups so we only fund the cooperatives that have already been working together for a number of years in a particular activity to make sure that there is good social cohesion there because if somebody could come in and put a group together not understanding the social dynamics of those women or that community, and it could potentially be a disaster. So just something to be very mindful of. Okay. Very good point. So can I add? So when, we, when I was lucky enough to be out at, at some of these shade collecting uh, communities in, in Northern Ghana, one of the things they spoke about was um, the next generation sort of teaching and training the next generation and whether there would be that interest. I mean, it's, it's, they want their children in schools. They were excited that their children were in schools. So the question I have is sort of how you see this uh, in future generations. Uh, could it get to the point where it's something that is a, 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 you know, a job that people would like to do in addition to, to having an education? 
I think that's a very interesting discussion that the that industry needs to have. Um, I think that it. Um, I believe different organizations are probably thinking about it um, independently, and I think it's a dialogue that we need to um, start having. Like, is there really a next generation of women shade collectors? Um, the women, this the current group of women that we have, yes, they're, do, they're getting older and they're investing in their kids' education. And when you go to Northern Ghana or some of the communities, half of the women want to become nurses, um, not shit collectors. The first thing they will tell you is, oh, I want to be a nurse. Um, so, and my question to them is like, why, why is that interesting? And for them, it's like, oh, we're doing something different. You know, we went to school to do this, and it's, you were helping save lives and all of that stuff. Um, and I think it's really helping, helping the group of women that we have now understand the value um, in the industry and having them pass that down to your children. Like, how do you do it differently? How do you do it better? Um, and it's in little things like going from using um, probably like mud stoves into more fuel efficient stoves. So how do we show that the industry itself and the processing of shade, collecting it and all that is even, it's being modernized for it to be a little more interesting to them. And how do we show them that it is not, it's not hard work. Well, it, it is hard work, but how do we make it less? <laughs> it is hard work, but uh, like even in collecting, like is there a way to give them rollers or other things that make it much easier for them? Um, and also really helping them understand that Shea is, um, it, it's a source of income. It's, um, I, my, my, my point is, you don't necessarily have to raise a whole lot of capital to be to start a shade business. Like you just go into you, you pick the kernels and you process it. So shade in itself is something you can raise capital for to be able to do other complementary income um, income generating activities. So it's really helping them change the mentality around it. And I feel like everybody in this room actually has that responsibility. Um, and we need to do it jointly as well to change the, the dialogue, the, the positioning of what she work looks like to this woman. Uh, I'd like to add to it. So I often joke that if I knew that I was going to get into the she industry, I should have stayed in Ghana and you know, migrate back um, straight into the northern region and just do that if I knew when I was little than to come to America and go to all this you know, expensive education, right? <laughs> and still end up so much having this interest in it, right? And now, with my decision, do I move back home and really process this full time? So I think the key is educating these late um, girls to understand the importance of entrepreneurship and even owning things yourself. Right. So that should be part of the, even when we are um, introducing education to them, it should be part of the curriculum that um, we teach them. And also, um, you um, bring in technology. How do we use technology to help these um, younger generation realize how they can make this better, more than what you and that matters when you uh, use them? Just to add to that. Um, about modeling and showing examples to the young women. To also pinpoint to them the areas in the sort of the value chain where there are opportunities to make more money that are currently occupied by men, such as the traders and the managers and things of that nature. People are ahead in the organization that their only roles are not just to be bakers and processors. There are other roles within the value chain that they can play that are much more profitable, that be, might be more exciting for them when they're thinking about career options. And, or, okay, so your mom has been a picker for a long time. How can you better work with her cooperative to move them forward to, as you were saying, to be um, sort of producers of end products for the market? How they can help to sort of evolve what they've seen their parents do to the next level. And it will require the new generation to be able to do that for these women. Because I feel like they have a certain way that they can go. They, they carry the baton a certain way, and now it's like a relay. They need the next generation to come and pick that up and take it to the finish line. And to add to that, I think that's 
with so many other industries that are, as social media and the internet are, are, are becoming more prevalent in our lives and businesses, it's just what you said. Um, their daughters may not want to grow up and be shade collectors, but they could find ways to market the cooperative so that people like um, Madam from Elera can know this is how I find a cooperative. I go online and I can see they have a marketing page up, they have a finance director, they have a social media man. So they can still modernize the Shea industry just like any other industry that's still here today in 2019 and viable. So I think that, yes, if we think about it 100 years from now, we're not going to be still collecting Shea from the ground. There's going to be all types of robots and equipment or men that will be doing it for us. <laughs> but I think that there's always going to be a role as we grow and as everything um, continues to evolve. And Shea Butter is not going anywhere, but it's up to us and to them to modernize and ensure that there still are roles that can be modern and that you can be proud of and make a lot more money than collecting shape, but you can still be in that full circle value chain. I think our time is up. We have more time? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. <coughs> so we can let's let's continue the discussion. We'd love to hear I from you. Yes. Maybe a GSA can I have a, a research and development area where you uh, I'm sorry. My name is Luttrell Yahas. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And I have a small um, hair and skincare line and my major product is the shea butter. So I'm basically here to just get the uh, the uh, uh, more knowledge uh, about the shea butter. But I would, after listening to everyone, I uh, my comment is, uh, uh, we, we, we are we're talking about the, uh, the manual labor of collecting the shea nuts. Uh, how about uh, maybe putting aside funds for a research and development area where uh, you can create uh, a piece of equipment to collect the shea nuts. That's, that's, that's a comment. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'd like to um, address that and then also on the... Excuse me? I'm sorry. <laughs> the next generation of share and the pre-financing. First, on the pre-financing, it is important to understand that the Global Share Alliance recommends to our members to pre-finance the women cooperatives. Pre-financing is important because it gives them money so that they are not under pressure to sell it for any price. Over the years, 20, 30 years ago, when you get into the communities, you normally have somebody in that community. Um, whether we're in the food or the cosmetic business, these are important issues that we need to continually keep top of mind because we have to keep this industry sustainable. So thank you all very much. Thank you.